Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, Roger and Joey are talking about why you can't trust weather sealing. And to help, they're joined by Chris Campit, founder and editor-in-chief at The Fablographer. Between Chris's gear reviews and Roger and Joey's repair experience, they've seen far too many broken cameras to ever take manufacturers' claims of weatherproofing seriously. You'll hear why this is such a difficult problem to solve, what kinds of weather do the most damage, and what you can do to limit damage to your own gear. Here are Roger, Joey, and Chris. All right, Chris. How you doing? I, I, I'm, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all right. It seems like I just interrupted one of y'all. <laughs> Chris Campit is our guest this morning on the... Uh, we, we're recording in the morning, in case you can't tell from that introduction. <laughs> Editor-in-chief at The Fulblographer, uh, Chris Campit. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm all right. How are you guys doing this morning? Uh, we're, all, we're all decent for a Friday. Yeah. Doing yeah, well. It's Friday. Yeah. The other voices you're hearing are Joey and Roger. Who our, our listeners will be familiar with from previous episodes of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're talking weather sealing today. And I, I want to start with a question because Roger gave me a note before we started recording. To not say weather sealing. To not I say know. weather sealing. <laughs> all, all my notes say weather sealing. Yeah. So forgive me if I, you know, lapse back into that vernacular as we're going. But yeah, my first question is, why weather resistance over weather sealing? Uh, what's the difference in terms there to you? Well, I think I think the sealing myself is a marketing term because people think it's sealed. I can go in the weather. And my response to that is always the same. If it was so well sealed, why does the warranty say water damage is not covered? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, too, I mean, like some people sometimes – uh, misconstrue it as something like being waterproofing, which is completely different. But uh, to Roger's point, weather resistance means that, you know, it puts up a little bit of resistance to weather and in some cases dust as well. Exactly. Yeah, I think the dust is an important thing. Looking at the teardowns these days, I think they're more focused on the dust than the water, perhaps, in the lenses. Well, from our own experience, customers complain about dust more than anything else, even though it doesn't affect images. Of course. So that's not, that's not new. They did that when we started. Right. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, cause it's, it's companies trying to basically cover the rest. Yeah. So typically, and I'm coming this up to all of this from a general place of not knowing much of anything. Typically dust is what this resistance is focused on. Not so much water in the lenses, in the lenses. Yeah. In the bodies, it would be more water more because water. dust is not as, Big of a problem. And I think it's a, a good thing to, you know, just emphasize the point that everybody knows but doesn't always think about. The weakest link is the weakest link. So if you have a really well covered camera that's got lots of seals and you put a leaky lens in front of it, your system is leaky. Oh, yeah. So you've got to do both. Oh, yeah. We've gotten so many dirty sensors from that. And in addition to that, I mean, um, it's it's more than just water. I guess I would say precipitation, which I guess is covering all sorts of water, right? It's a better term. Okay. So humidity, things like that as well? Snow, sleet, uh, water. Um, I've even sometimes done tests involving college students and beer, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Lens Rolls has, has done some of those tests as well. <laughs> I'm sure. The Coke can test is also important. Speaking of different types of precipitation here, you know, because uh, I, I would imagine Coke is a lot, Coke or beer or anything like that, anything that leaves a residue is a lot more damaging than just, well, you know, tap water. Coke is a lot more damaging because it is, it's acidic. Yes. So Coke are there. In your car, can't it? Like if you put it on your hood, wasn't that proven like at one point or another? Oh I, yeah. You yeah. can, you can use it to do all sorts of stuff like that. There's the, uh, the, the battery old, terminal thing. Yeah. There's the age old, um, yeah. what am I thinking of? Science fair project where kid takes their baby teeth and leaves them soaking in coke over a couple of weeks and they just dissolve in oh yeah Ugh. yeah but Gosh. it's also a pretty practical test at times we haven't done it in years but because like i mean i'm a former wedding photographer i've had glasses of wine spilled on my suit and then running onto my old 5ds and then mm -hmm. i've had coke cans and you know jack and coke and cocktails and all that kind of stuff and um, you know, we talk about precipitation, but that kind of stuff is also equally important to event and wedding photographers who, you know, have to be around all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. 
And I think we've kind of made a nice gradation. There is fairly pure water, which mm-hmm. is like precipitation most of the time. Mm-hmm. There's water with stuff in it, like Cokes and beer. Mm-hmm. And then we get to the other extreme, which is salt water. Oh, yeah. And that's a different kettle of fish. And I hear people go, well, I've been in the rain with this four times. It's fine. You hadn't been on the beach. You haven't been on the beach. Different thing entirely. Totally. We'll get stuff back where a customer will say, well, uh, I got sprayed by the ocean, but you know, I wiped it off. It should be fine. And then it gets here back to us a week later and everything's gone. Yeah, narrator, but it was not fine. <laughs> We've had manufacturers say that as, too, as well, too, when it comes to weather sealing or weather resistance, uh, rather, because, you know, we were debating the name of this episode earlier on, so I'm going to stick with weather resistance. Some brands have been like, oh, yeah, no, there's sealing or resistance only at the rubber ring at the mounts. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you know, if you take it out in the rain, it'll be fine. And we've proven that that's not always the case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that thing where people, you know, uh, this is this is one of the keys. They get splashed to the ocean, like Joey said. They wipe it off. Everything's fine. They continue to use the equipment. It's fine. Until a week later when it dies because that little bit of salt water that got inside has now eaten away at electrical circuits. Mm-hmm. And it's a very different thing. Most manufacturers, by the way, e- even third-party repair, if you send in a camera or lens and you go, stopped working, wiped it all down and they open it and see the first bit of salt, they send it back. They won't touch it. Yep. They won't fix it. Yep. And the reasons that everybody goes, they're unreasonable. They're not. Whatever they see that's eaten up, they can replace, but they can't see what is still yet to be. eaten up. Mm-hmm. So they can't give you a repair warranty knowing right. that that same salt is eating other circuit boards in other places. Which has always annoyed me because they shouldn't even say that there's any sort of resistance then in that case. Right. Yeah. Well, that goes back to my thing about they, they talk about it a lot in their marketing blurbs, but they don't warranty it. Right. Rather, weather resistance is purely marketing. That's well, I, there's, I mean, when there's some, you take them apart, you see a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's some where they've got lots of seals. And, you know, well, as I said earlier, it's always the weakest part. You know, I've seen cameras where the, one of my favorites, it was sealed like nothing I've ever seen except around the battery door. So <laughs> if you set it in any water, you were toast, but you could be out in a thunderstorm <laughs> and you were okay. Do you guys know if it's different for like brands that have IP ratings attached to their cameras, like uh, some OMDS options and some of the higher end Leica options? It is supposed to be. I can't firsthand say, cause I haven't disassembled enough of those to go, but right. if they have a rating, they had to meet some standards. And I assume sure. if you don't have a rating, well, you didn't. Right, right. Yeah. There's plenty of videos of like people taking their Pendex cameras into a shower or yeah. like covering them in dirt and it's still working. So. So I think there's truth to that. Yeah. Um, but it's all, it, you know, I think it, the one thing about it is you never know where is the weak point. And like the one camera, it was the battery door. We've had another where it's the viewfinder. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as somebody who repairs stuff, if you see me out in the rain, there's baggies on everything because I'm just paranoid. <laughs> That's the best weather sealing you it can really get. Is. <laughs> Cheap. It's, it's, uh, it's effective. Yeah, that that is a perfect transition to my next question, which is, you know, if, if we're telling people, I guess I should start by kind of summarizing your opinion on weather resistance down to whether uh, I would trust weather resistance to the point where, hey, having great weather resistance is great if something happens accidentally yeah. that you're not expecting. But no amount of weather resistance is an excuse to unprotected just go shoot in the rain. Is that about? I think that's true. Chris, you you shoot a lot more than I do. What do you think? You think that's fair? I think, well, there are two parts of this answer, right? Um, I purposely, whenever a brand says that a camera or a lens is weather resistant or has, you know, it varies per brand. I think Sony really likes to use dust and moisture and splash resistant or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll take them out into the rain. And I've talked with manufacturers about this. Like what if I set up a camera on a tripod and I do like a time lapse on the rain, they're like, that might be okay, but you might as well just go around walking with around with it. And I'll be like, okay, fine. Um, and I mean, usually those cameras will be pretty okay. At least with like, again, I'm sticking with Sony here. Uh, the newer ones, like the, a1 and the a7 IV, especially because for years those cameras have had major issues around the hot shoe, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I'm going to use that as a segue into my other point. I think weather resistance isn't necessarily just about 
you know, the use and abuse that you will do in heavy precipitation or heavy dust. It also prolongs the build quality and longevity and reliability of the product. If you're too uh, scared to take your camera and your lens that are both weather resistant out into the rain, you will still have some sort of guarantee that it's going to be a lot more reliable. The sensor is less likely to get dirty and uh, all the internal parts will just work and won't have any sort of issues as a result of like debris or moisture or anything like that. So you guys mentioned plastic baggies earlier, and that's a really common solution. Um, and rubber bands. Plastic. OK, so rubber band a plastic baggie around your camera. And gaff tape. Or gaff tape, yep. All right. Are there are there any other, you know, just additional steps people can take? Um, don't, don't go in the rain. Yeah, don't, don't go in the rain. To, uh, don't shoot at Burning Man unless you plan on throwing your cameras away. That's my point. Yeah. And if you talk about rain, I think going out in a wide brimmed hat is often pretty protective. Yeah. That yeah, makes sense. yeah. Yeah. That does work. You just keep it near your body or whatever. Yeah. I, I have some incredibly ugly hats that I take out. <laughs> if, 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 if personal aesthetics are, are a concern, they do make those like raincoats and stuff for your gear, but they're not any more effective. Okay. They just, they just look nicer. Man, the, the you other guys are is, just going straight down my outline. I didn't really? even send my outline out. <laughs> that is also, literally my and, next question. But, you know, in the pocket of a camera bag or your pocket, mm-hmm. you can put three baggies and eight rubber bands. It takes up no space. Absolutely. Why not always have them? Okay. We, we we rent some of those ring covers, and every time a customer would ask me about them, I'd be like, yeah, you could rent them, or you could just, you know, get some bags from, like, some garbage bags from home. Yeah. Yeah. I love the opportunity anytime on this show to tell people not to rent something that we rent, but that's it. <laughs> those, yeah. Those are, you know, we rent those things because people ask for them. And if you prefer that over a plastic bag, if only to, you know, look more professional, if you're sure. you know working a job, that's a good point. And that is, yeah. Worthwhile. yeah. But I, I don't think we, we would never tell anybody that they're any more effective than just a plastic bag yeah. and are certainly nothing, you know, we just like manufacturers renting a lens coat from us does not, preclude you from being charged for water damage Correct. so yeah i would trust that about as much as we do which is not a ton right there are also other steps though too i mean a lot of people sometimes when they're going out they might accidentally forget to fully close like the sd card port door and the Mm -hmm. battery door as we were talking about Mm -hmm. plus i mean all those areas with ports like sometimes they're not always fully pressed down and those are pretty important Something I've actually gone back to doing in the past year or so, especially with products that, you know, they say there is a little bit of weather resistance at the mount, uh, bringing back UV protection filters, believe it or not. Um, And I've realized that, like, that adds even more longevity to the camera or the lens. Well, the lens in this case, I'm sorry. Uh, Those are good points, Chris. I, I think the one thing people really need to realize that Chris brought up all those ports are straight connected to the motherboard. So if you get anything in that port, you have basically poured it on the motherboard of your camera. Yeah. So if you do open those port covers, um, it's just like using a GoPro or something like that. If Before you press that seal back down, make sure there's no grit or dirt in on those covers or in the grooves because that will just compromise the seal. And if you're out using a port, like you have a monitor or something mm-hmm. and it starts raining, consider whether you can disconnect that. For sure. Same deal, I guess, then if you're shooting video with your, you know, oftentimes you got to leave that HDMI port open if you're mm-hmm. running to an external recorder. So things like that are things to probably worry about in the right. rain. Yeah. And you can cut up a baggie and <laughs> put them over your cables. Over the entire thing. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, but you can put it over the handle and the cables yeah, or whatever absolutely. you need. Um, anything helps. And I think that's it. We can't make it waterproof, but every seal is a little more resistance. I mean, you know, you get some silicone sealing. You can right. seal things yeah, up I mean, if you're super worried, it's not impossible to just rent an underwater housing from us and Absolutely. shoot using that. I mean, that would be a, a major step to take, but it's doable. Well, we've had people do that, though. There's a friend of mine who shoots mostly waves in Hawaii, and he stands on the surf, but he shoots from an underwater housing for that. He knows he's going to get splashed. I know people that have taken underwater housings to Burning Man. I also want to add, because, I mean, you know, I've been running for blogger for 13 years, but we've seen different things in different seasons. I feel like, for example, in, again, I'm based in New York. Um, We have staff all over the world. And um, 
in like the temperate and now kind of subtropical zone that New York is mm-hmm. due to, uh, you know, past mm-hmm. occurrences. Mm-hmm. Fall <laughs> and spring are when there's a lot of like extra dust flying around for sure. Pollen. Kind of like pollen and leaves and all that stuff. And then in winter, you know, condensation can occur a lot more. And then in summer, same thing can happen if you're going in and out of like an AC unit area with like, uh, you know, a hundred and something degrees outside. Um, so different seasons have sort of different problems that are more attributed to them. Yeah. In a, in our case, it's pollen in the spring is yeah. just insane and gets all over everything. The pollen is so bad here. It's almost like going to a color run. Right. Yeah. In certain like in certain months, you can be parked in a parking lot at work and then your car is like a little yellow by the time you leave. It's awful. So, Chris, I'm sure, you know, in in your time running the Fablographer, you have a lot more experience with those sort of like lens coat style third party like add on accessory solutions. Are are there any of those that you would recommend over others? There used to be, man. We're in 2022 right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I literally had to go like, a year like a couple of days ago. But like yeah. 10 years ago, there were a couple of Kickstarters where y'all remember that thing? I think it was called the Lens Donut or something like that. It was basically like this extra layer of rubber gasket that went at the back of your lens. Where it mounted the camera? Yeah, exactly yeah. right there. I remember that. And they were they were really pitching it very hard for like fifty one eights and stuff like that. Um, ever since the years have progressed, uh, it really kind of varies per manufacturer. Like Panasonic uh, gives weather resistance to their fifty one eight. Sony, I think, does a little bit as well. Nikon surely does. For some odd reason, Canon refuses to give any sort of weather resistance to anything that's not an L lens. Right. Um. So over the years, you know, I've just said, you know. Just go for something that's weather resistant more than anything else. And if you're getting something that's only really sealed or resistant at the mount, then make sure that you use the UV filters. In addition to that, just be a little bit extra careful. Uh, Sometimes it's a good idea to even reverse the lens hood to give an extra amount of protection because, you know, the front seat, the front uh, filter will protect that area, but you have that whole lens body now. What are you going to do about that? And the best thing you could do is really just reverse the lens hood in any way. I'll admit I haven't gone as far as using bags. And uh, the one time that I really thought about doing it was, uh, oh man, it hasn't happened in a couple of years, the polar bear per, uh, plunge that happens here in oh, New York yeah. every year. Oh yeah, yeah, I know those. They would do yeah. those. Yeah. Um, Man, my pants and my boots got soaked in the Atlantic Ocean, but I was using, back then there was still Olympus, a camera with, I think it was the EM1X, with a very high IP rating for any sort of camera. So I just ended up holding the camera over my head, and whenever I wanted to shoot, I would just bring it back down. Um, But I've seen a lot of photojournalists use those bags and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the short answer is... Just be careful and go for more weather resistant products. They're, they've become very affordable over the past couple of years. And I don't know if you guys have seen the same trend. Like I was listening to another episode of yours uh, recently. I feel like because of the lack of components, a lot of secondhand gear is sometimes more expensive than first uh, firsthand brand new gear. So just buy brand new if you can. And to like, you know, if you're especially if you're a professional, you know, if you make any amount of money shooting photographs, you should probably have your equipment insured regardless. But yeah, if it's if it's something you're super, super, super worried about, insurance is also not as expensive as people, I think, assume it is. Yeah. Yeah. But also in addition to that, too, sometimes insurance might be like, oh, no, we don't want to cover that. And that it is annoying. yeah it is hard to find coverage that you, you never know that you're going to get covered for sure weather damage yeah and especially yeah. again if it's salt they're they're just not gonna so yeah. you we've we've mentioned a couple of manufacturers in general and i'm sure especially roger will be reluctant to answer this question with a yes Nah, all my ndas are gone oh great. <laughs> yeah no. 
do you think uh, are there any manufacturers who I don't want to say are better at this because again we we keep leaning toward telling people not to rely on this entirely but maybe put more of an emphasis on this when designing their lenses than others Chris is going to know better than me but I'm going to throw out Pentax and Micro Four Thirds I was going to say um, specifically for Micro Four Thirds I want to say OM Digital Solutions Mm -hmm. Um, Panasonic in previous meetings like behind closed doors that I've said certain things are IP rated and then later on, they'd be like, no, we never said that. And I'm like, OK, cool. Um, OMDS, though, straight up does full on say that their stuff is IP rated. Just for anyone curious, IP ratings are the same sort of durability ratings that a lot of cell phones go through. Um, there's one number that corresponds to uh, moisture and water resistance, and the other number corresponds to dust resistance. And all this information is freely available online. Um, OMDS and Leica for the SL system goes as far as IP rating their gear. Uh, let's let's go down no, the no, list no. of other manufacturers, though. We said Pentax. Before we leave Leica for SL, you are talking about Leica brand, not Leica supervised, like Panasonic Leica. Correct. Right. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I don't even consider that. You know, I used to call that panel Leica. Um, <laughs> it's now Panasonic. <laughs> yeah, it's Panasonic. But yes, you are correct. Leica's in the SL mount, Leica proper, all of their gear is actually IP rated. They actually, no, I take that back. Their cameras have the full IP rating. I've asked them before about the lenses. They said they're built to the same standard. We just haven't gone out and fully IP rated the lenses. OMDS, on the other hand, and even when they were Olympus, has gone out and fully IP rated everything. The rest of the brands, though, Canon, um, I'm going down the list right now, Canon. Canon gear, like the R5 and even down to the EOS R and the RP, those are incredibly weather resistant. We've taken those things out in snow, in uh, rain, almost hurricane-like rain, and we were using weather-resistant lenses, not only at the mount, but fully throughout. And those things have taken a beating that uh, anyone else would pretty, basically cringe at. Same goes for Nikon, especially for the new Z9 and um, the Z7 II and the Z6. The Z5 is almost to that standard. Nikon with lenses is a little... They change their communications. There are some lenses, they're not S lenses. So S is like the equivalent of their higher end, like Canon L or Sony G Master. Right. Mm -hmm. um, their S lenses, they say, have splash, moisture, and dust resistance, if I remember correctly. Or sometimes they do say weather resistance or weather sealing. Um, I've seen those in presentations. Their other lenses, like one of my favorites, the 40 millimeter F2, is not an S lens, but they say that the design had weather dust and moisture resistance built into the consideration and for nikon that basically means that the lip of the lens is going over the mount there's no sort of rubber ceiling though mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um okay so we said canon we said leica we said omds uh sony sony um and you guys have actually shown this yourself in the g master lenses they're very incredibly well built even their G series lenses, the primes are incredibly well, well built. Their 24 to 105 is an absolute dust magnet. I think it's better used as a doorstop than anything else. Their cameras have gotten better. Um, with the newest iterations, the uh, the A7S III, the A7 IV, and then the A1, the weather resistance has taken another level, especially because now... Uh, the sensor cover comes down over the sensor when the camera is turned off. Right. Um, in addition to that, too, there's even more weather seals or resistance built into the hot shoe. So Sony used to have this problem. You guys might have seen it as well, too, where you're using it without a hot shoe cover in the rain. And then suddenly the camera will just have this giant thing on there saying, oh, problem with attachment. Uh, please check. And it'll yep. completely lock out the camera and you can't use it. It was the stupidest thing. For years, but that's not really the case anymore. And it's a huge struggle to keep track of those hot shoe covers. We <laughs> we yeah. have like drawers full of those, oh my God. and they're not easy to get all the time from Sony. Yeah, yeah. we end up trying to three D print those because we were so short for a while. Yeah, yeah. I think they're yeah. too think small, and the tolerances are yeah. too tight to three D print them. But we tried it. Yeah. yeah, 
Um, so we said we said Leica. We said Panasonic um, has weather resistance. We've used a lot of their products in both snow and rain, and they are reliable as long as you're getting the products that are really said um, to have that resistance. Are you differentiating Panasonic M43 and Panasonic L here? Um, they're together. They're basically all together in this case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw in having done a few disassemblies lately. And it's not just Panasonic. I, I, it brought us my attention, but it's, it's several of the brands now. We used to think a Joe's lens was made by Joe in Joe's factory and assembled there. And that's just not the case anymore. Mm-hmm. Yep. So when you've got a brand on the outside, it's getting very iffy to assume that's the brands on the inside. Oh, Tamron made this for them. And, ooh, Sigma made this for them. Mm. Uh, and you see that kind of stuff. And even some Chinese factories who made this for them. And that's often the case. So I'm a little leery about telling people this brand is great if it's a last three or four-year lens because you just don't know. Right. I agree with you. I was actually I'm so glad you brought up Tamron because for the money and for how light they are, they're built incredibly durable. Yeah, they are. To the elements. And that's one where you go to Tamron or Sigma, and really Canon, they probably made almost everything that's in their lenses. They also make some stuff for other lenses. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Tamron makes really, and also better quality lenses than we used to see. You know, Yeah, yeah, they really have. Tamron used to be, yeah. a, well, it was affordable. And now there's, right. some, there's some Tamron and Sigma that's like, that's the best lens available for that. Right, right. Yeah, and that all makes sense. Like these things are getting so complicated and in it, Almost no manufacturer has total control over every single oh, yeah. component of their lens. There are electronics and glass and probably well, coming from many different. And everybody, for example, I'm just using linear autofocus motors, but everybody's got them in their lenses now. Yet none of those people have patents on those. Nope. They aren't making <laughs> well, them. No. Right. Yeah. So it's just uh, at least very difficult, maybe impossible for a manufacturer to like completely control every element of that supply exactly. line. Exactly. All right, I think we'll take a quick break right there, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about what weather damage looks like and what to do if it happens to your camera. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. Joey, Roger, and I are talking with Chris Gampett of The Photographer about why you shouldn't trust weather sealing. You, you mentioned earlier, and I want to get back to this. This is probably one mainly for Joey. You know, the, it, often weather damage is not, the, the effect you see is not just you're out in the rain and your camera immediately stops working, especially in the case of salt. Sometimes the effects of these problems can't be seen until days later. What does weather damage look like if if somebody's having a problem with their camera you know what do we typically see you know salt and dust cause in our cameras that come back um the first signs of it are usually um external screw heads will start to get a little white corrosion on them Mm -hmm. um hot shoe contacts will start to get a little usually green corrosion on them battery contacts battery contacts too you'll see um that's usually the first sign that something has gone really wrong um glitchy performance um ports stopping working like all of a sudden your microphone don't work anymore or your headphone port doesn't work anymore uh but everything else seems to be fine well yeah you've probably got something in there and that's with cameras for lenses you're usually looking around the mount screws sometimes you can look down in in and see like water in your glass that's a really bad thing <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah one thing this is off topic but joey mm-hmm. It just popped into my head and it won't stay there. So I'm jumping right in. <laughs> um, Joey's talked about Burning Man a few times and that's yeah. alkali dust. Yes. If you get alkali dust in your camera and then go to New England and go in and out of air, you know, cold and hot, Ooh. you get moisture in your camera and alkali dust and moisture is basically salt water. Yeah. Jeez. It'll Ooh. just destroy everything from the inside out. 
So, yeah, maybe the title of this episode is going to be "Don't Go to Burning Man." <laughs> well, there's always that's <laughs> at least the title don't of take my our life. stuff to Burning Man. I, I think yeah. there's at least four episodes that we've done that we could. Yeah, we but, talk about Burning Man almost more than anything. <laughs> it's else. not just Burning Man, but <laughs> desert dust is alkali. Desert dust, dust. right? Any kind of desert so, dust. So it's so typically we, fine, and we'll get into stuff a lot easier than even yeah. sand, for instance. Very It'll much. get into things you think you've seen. Oh yeah, yeah. including yeah. your ones. right. A lot of folks sometimes think that things like, you know, those Gigiados rocket blowers will just get rid of everything. They help, but sometimes they can also just make things worse. It can blow the dust further into the lens. Right. Very good. Right, 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 Mm -hmm. right. Chris, I was going to ask you this, too, because I think you may have experienced it. You shoot more than any of us here. Maybe Joey shoots somewhat close to you. I'm way back. You're out in the fresh water, rainstorm. Your camera stops working. What do you do? Cry. Yeah, well, that's (laughs) it. What do you do? Um, Throw it in some rain. Well, uh, no. the cool thing you go back home. Um, well, if you need to shoot something professionally, you probably have some sort of backup camera with you. So you take out your backup, you shoot with it like underneath your jacket or something like that. And you, you know, you'd be a little careful. Um, when you get back home or back to the studio, you put the thing in some rice and you take out the battery and you leave it there covered for. You know, for good measure, I'd say 72 hours. And usually that will help because rice really absorbs some things. If you don't have rice, silica packets. You can get those out of your medicine most of the time, too. Yeah. yeah. Also, if you're if you got a local Walmart, you can buy big can big jars of desiccant. Walgreens yeah. sells little packets of it too. Mm-hmm. We've recommended yeah. this. This has also come up on the show a yeah. lot. We recommend keeping like a handful of those in your camera bag just all the time. And you can buy them in bulk from like Amazon or whatever, and just like have a bunch of them. And that's very helpful. Especially yeah. if you go hot and cold. Mm-hmm. I remember the original A7S, our rep at Sony was just like, yeah, you can go ahead and run it under a faucet. I did that for like three minutes. It just stopped working. I put it in rice for 48 hours and they were like, oh yeah, no, we said moisture and splash resistance, not something like that i was like okay <laughs> fine but every other manufacturer at the time was letting us do it pentax let us do it olympus let us do it panasonic even let us do it with a previous micro four thirds camera so yeah um did it come back to life eventually yeah uh, I think it's, the fresh water if you leave them alone and don't turn them on and send electrons surging through it mm. a lot of times they'll come back if it's mm-hmm. salt water just throw it trash two other things that were on my mind um before i lose the idea um, Fujifilm products are also incredibly well weather sealed, providing they have the WR moniker in there. Mm-hmm. Um, we brought them into monsoon like rains over at Coney Island, which is, you know, right next to the Atlantic Ocean. Mm-hmm. And they've worked incredibly reliably. My entire staff has done this. We love them. Sigma stuff, the art stuff and the uh, sports stuff are incredibly well weather resistant. The uh, contemporary lenses are only sealed of any sort at the mount, but the reps have said, you know, you can take it out into the rain and it'll work. And I've said, well, we can't tell customers that because what if it doesn't work? Right. And, and it's suddenly we're to blame or the manufacturer is to blame. And the manufacturer is basically, as Roger said earlier on, they're not going to uh, repair the lens. Right. Yeah. And then you're caught in the snafu where you try to return it to the retailer. The retailer is not going to take it back. And then the manufacturer is not going to take it back. And it's like, oh, what do you do? You just have this nice looking Sigma lens you can put on your shelf. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because so many people I, I see online are like this brand and that brand. When you're really talking about, there's very different situations. You use Sigma, the, the sport art versus contemporary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everyone's got two lines and it's not this brand. It's this part of this brand. Right. Or even down mm-hmm. to this particular lens or even this particular copy yeah i think uh, chris you've you've worked with manufacturers a lot and roger you've torn a lot of this stuff down is there anything manufacturers can be doing to make weather sealing more effective that they're not doing or is it just an inevitable law of physics this is just going to happen situation i I think they could for very little money take the what you know chris just mentioned the contemporaries it wouldn't cost them a couple of bucks to add basically some sealing to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think they like to differentiate that. Mm-hmm. So that they could do. Could they do better than their better weather ceiling? No, really not. Um, there has to be air movement. Right. 
So if, you know, if we're going to have air movement, we're going to have moisture movement. It's not avoidable. But and, if, uh, yeah, we, we talked about Canon earlier. The R5 is a hot camera. Mm-hmm. It has to move more air. Mm-hmm. It can't be as well sealed or it will even melt. I don't know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's only so much they can do. In yeah. addition to that, too, to go even further, if they did anything else that I had in mind, they would greatly sacrifice ergonomics. Mm-hmm. Um, like for example, let's say, let's take the, the Sony 50 millimeter F 1.2 G master, for example, right? If that were just a single piece of aluminum, then that would be easier for them to weather resist because, you know, there wouldn't be holes for all those like other things, but you know, you have to have grippy area. You have to have things like a focusing ring. They like to add in those other, uh, little buttons for programming. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, anything that they could do would sacrifice quite a bit. There's also the other capitalistic side. Uh, if they made them too weather resistant, well, then people wouldn't break them all the time and have to buy new ones. <laughs> oh, Joey with the conspiracy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah he's right. He's right. Yeah. I agree with it. But I mean, 3D at very least would be, uh, these lenses would be a lot more expensive. Yeah, well, you this know, stuff does cost money to do. Yeah, I'll give you a flip example because I, I I did testing and work with NASA, mm-hmm. and so they're sending lenses that are going to go through massive vibration, six to eight G, on the Earth in a vacuum, two hundred fifty degrees, one hundred thirty degrees, and they send them after they've modified them to test. But mm-hmm. most of that modification is everything is soldered in place and nothing can move. Yep. So fixed focus at infinity. Yep. Nothing zooms, nothing changes. The aperture can't move. I think that's what you'd have to do to really make a sealed lens. Right. Probably insane heavy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we can all do push ups, let's be honest. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe we could use something a little heavier. Well, and, you know, what would be better to do all that to the lens or buy an underwater housing? Right. These things are a few hundred dollars or insurance. All that is a lot cheaper than insurance. But again, it's a problem to get water damage covered with insurance even i've also been saying for a couple of years now and i mean uh the recent sigma and like a collaboration really proved this to me if they start incorporating more metals and less plastics it might be easier for them for repair because metal is something that is probably just easier for them to get recycled necessarily than plastic um i especially say this with the cla- with brass for example i mean a brass lens or a brass camera feels so great. And, you know, they could charge more and people would pay for it. Um, There's some contra to that, though, because with with metals, you've got an expansion coefficient, which has to be with the tighter tolerances could be critical. And and then the other part of it basically is that they can. I, 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 this kind of a, a thing of mine, but very often I hear people go, this is a high quality lens, very well built. And, by that, they mean heavy or metal case. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Inside, there's a great deal of limitations of what you can do with metal. And mm. some of it has to be polycarbonate. You can do polycarbonate to better tolerances. And you can do polycarbonate, give some shock absorbing that metal doesn't give. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Sony 7200 28 GM, the first version, was a great example of let's put a metal plate in the middle. The metal plate bent over time, and that's why so many of those lenses are not what they were supposed to be optically, because there's a bend in the center of the lens that you can't get to. Plastic, in that case, could have been, it's either broke or it's not. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's a whole lot of that that they they can do metal, but it doesn't necessarily make it better. Right. And the last time we did stats on breakage of lenses, metal lenses had a slightly higher breakage rate. Perhaps because they're heavier. But they feel nice. <laughs> they do feel nice. Yeah, I'm not they do feel very good. <laughs> Nothing feels better than a nice metal like a nice metal like so, a yeah. camera. But yeah, yes. man. Those old Zeiss Milvis primes. They oh, were great. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. If I gave you identical lenses and I say, here is this nice heavy metal housing, and here is this light plastic housing. Mm-hmm. And otherwise they're identical. And the plastic housing is five hundred dollars less. What are you gonna go? Uh, this is not a hypothetical question. I know it's not. Yeah, <laughs> we have people. We have to talk people through this all the time mm-hmm. with those Rokinon cine lenses. Right, are optically identical to their like plastic, yeah, um, DS cine lenses, and, and nobody will use the DS. Right, 
yeah, everybody wants to pay more money for those Rokinon. And not not that metal housing and, you know, it, in the case of cinema lenses, it's very important that the cinema, you know, all the lenses in a focal length line be the same, like, physical size. Um, so it's not to say that that construction is nothing, but in terms of optical quality, it doesn't do anything. The only real optical difference is that the aperture, it's got more aperture blades, so it's smoother. Right. Smoother but, but I'm thinking in cinema lenses, people expect to pay more. Yes. They expect it to be big and heavy. They're set up for that. Right. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily true with the photo side. Right. Yeah, exactly. Those Pro. Z lenses are way more, way more popular than those Rokinon DS lenses, yeah, despite wild. being like pretty much... You know, not the same lens, but they're in a lot of ways, the same lens. Of the way. Yeah. If I was going to make a lens today for cinema, I'd put lead in it, make, <laughs> make it a good half pound heavier <laughs> than it needed to be. <laughs> Everybody would think it was great. Yeah. Uh, Aesthetics matter a lot, too. They do. They really I, do. I, I don't know. People, people, on the folks on that side are, uh, yeah. they like their, their colors, everything. They, it make it look as close as possible to something like that would have been used on a Paramount movie in the seventies, mm-hmm. uh, like little hand painted touches. Yeah. Oh, people yeah. go for that stuff. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, there's also something to be said for the durability of a lot of vintage cameras and lenses. It's one of the reasons why in the past decade they've been, you know, enjoying a Renaissance of so many sorts because they're so durable. Um, they still work. Like I have a Leica M six that's way older than me. Um, I'm 35. <laughs> Um, I loved my uh, Bronica ETRS when I owned it. I loved my Mamiya RB67 Pro S when I used it. And, you know, you go on YouTube right now and all these, like, I was about to say kids, and, you know, they're not kids. They're <laughs> just eyes better than I do. Yep. Um, they, they're all using these cameras. There's something to be said for those units that also, when they break, uh, they can be easily the replacement parts rather it can be easily 3d printed do do any Deal. of us think that our image stabilized linear autofocus electronic aperture control lenses are going to be working in 30 years much less 100 i don't think they're going to be right. working in 15 years yeah it's just not yeah. possible yeah the answer for people who are looking for perfect weather resistance is to just you know uh, use stuff that doesn't have any electronics in it right. go. i've got a Mamiya universal kit uh, that i shot polaroids on for for years now Last, not this past New Year's, but year before that, my girlfriend and I went. We went up to Carbondale, Illinois. Hey, yeah, and we went hiking through my alma mater, <laughs> Southern Illinois University, in beautiful downtown Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> we went hiking through um, the little big, the little Grand Canyon, a mm-hmm. uh, little state park out there. I've camped there; it's beautiful. It was a rainy day; uh, everything was pretty slick, and we went down this trail. That this has come up on the podcast. Before, oh yeah, so. it, we went this I might have cut it though previously, <laughs> and uh, we ended up going off trail and trying to like scale down the side of this cliff, which was not not a good idea. Um, I had my bag, it was a shoulder bag. I had it strapped over my shoulder, and it was it was encumbering me. And there was like a little ledge below us, so I took my bag off and I l- tried to lower it down to the ledge, but I had to drop it about a foot. And of course, it's a round bag. And so <laughs> oh, no. it rolled right off the cliff and fell 100 feet into the water below. Uh, I think it hit the rocks first. Uh, oh my God. So when I finally got it out of the water, like we finally got down there like 30 minutes later, I, there was a, a family already down there. So they fished it out of the water for me. I also dropped my tripod and shattered the carbon fiber center column. But a little gaff tape fixed that. That was fine. There you go. Um, <laughs> I opened up my bag to find that both the lenses were waterlogged. The body itself, totally undamaged. Rangefinder still well adjusted. The only thing that really broke, the two things that broke, my Sekonic L358 meter, which is the third one I have bought from us used because I've lost the other two. Uh, So waterlogged, it no longer works. Um, And the ground glass back I have for that camera is uh, the glass shattered but it's sandwiched between two sheets of plastic so it still works fine too wow oh wow so there's your answer folks i'm sure all our listeners will be satisfied with that just shoot old impractical film cameras that are impossible to find and you can do whatever you want more than that though like i do think that you give it a couple years there's probably even a some sort of renaissance where some manufacturer comes along and they take like the old Canon 51 f1.2 for EF and they rehouse it in something for like 
uh, that has manual focus and manual aperture control or something like that. It's mm, got to yeah. happen. Yeah. I think Duclos does a lot of that. Yes, they do. Yeah. Like, oh, well, well, there you go. All it's, right. It's good. I yeah. think Chris, what else do you need to talk about? We haven't talked about. We yeah. What do you, what do you got coming up on the photographer? Um, quite a bit. I mean, in terms of the art world, uh, you know, it's women's history month. So we've been focusing a lot on, uh, putting spotlight on women creators and all those kinds of things, uh, coming up later these months, actually we're working on a bunch of stories for Asian American Pacific Islander month, pride month, a couple other things like that. And then in addition to that too, I'm working like on what am I testing? I'm testing the Meyer Optique Trio Plan 35 millimeter f2.82, the second version. Okay. I'm using it on Canon RF. It's beautiful. And arguably for manual focus, I think the Canon RF system is the best system because they have this like built-in rangefinder system that's really nice. Um, I'm also really big on making sure that, you know, uh letting people know that our review team is all POCs and all women. Um, which that's is awesome. wow, a rarity out there. Yeah, that's very cool. So yeah, just I mean, keep your eyes peeled. We publish four times a day, and you know, we're incredibly ethical about the way we do things, the same way you folks are. Yeah, except uh, we don't publish four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> we're lucky to get four times a, a year. Yeah. yeah. Um I, I really try to tell people as well too to check out our website on our app because I mean Quite honestly, I hate banner ads, but I have to pay people a sustainable uh, pay. I've refused to pay say, slave wages. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, too, I, I like to treat my staff well. So um, through our app, you can actually get all of our content completely ad free for twenty four ninety nine a year. Um, I regularly spend more than I'm at, at a bar tab. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Joey certainly does. <laughs> yeah she's always been known to spend that for a drink yeah i'll see you this afternoon <laughs> joey yeah. yeah um yeah that's mostly about it otherwise yeah and uh, by the time this comes out probably you know most if not all of that will be out and available so if you're listening to this and any of the any of the upcoming photographer content uh made you curious it's it's probably ready to go so yeah we'll we'll put a link in the show notes to the photographer and any you know applicable articles and yeah i i do encourage our listeners to check that out it's a, the rare there's a lot of stuff out there that is not good <laughs> in the yeah. camera review and recommendation world and the the photographer is the, the rare good and helpful resource yeah, there's Absolutely. a lot that's not good and there's a lot that's just wrong yes exactly <laughs> Let's, yeah, and especially knowing that you pay people, that's also unfortunately very rare. <laughs> right. And I'll I'll just say as a businessman doing logical stuff in my head here, get that app while it's twenty four ninety nine because that's not gonna stay that low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hop on that deal. That's pretty good. Cool. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We'll we'll talk to you again soon. May, hopefully we'll get you on for a film photography episode. I would love to do that. Yeah, I would see. really love to do that. All right, guys. Thank you so much for having I me. I really, really appreciate it. For that. Yeah, Roger will take <laughs> Roger will spend that day at the beach. That's that's it. All right. We'll we'll see you later. Have a good one. Good talk right. to you, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. Chris and his staff's great work can be found at thefablographer.com. That's just the photographer, but with blog in there, thefablographer.com. As always, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at lensrentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lynch Rentals podcast, we're talking about one of Canon's most exciting lens releases in a long time, the 5.2mm dual fisheye. We think this lens and the workflow it enables in the Canon R5 have the potential to finally bring VR video into the mainstream. I know people have been saying that every few months for years, but we think this time it might actually be true. Find out why on the next episode of the Lynch Rentals podcast. Podcast.